Today, the world's shores are under attack. Armies of aliens are secretly invading our coasts. In the Caspian Sea, swarms of ghostly hunters have contributed to the collapse of entire commercial fisheries. In Europe, armored invaders are rampaging up rivers and threatening local fish stocks. The largest wetland in the world, the Pantanal, is being infiltrated by a silent killer that could destroy this fragile ecosystem. And throughout the world's oceans, huge blooms of toxic algae are contaminating shellfish, causing thousands of deaths. One of the big problems with biological invasions, of course, is that once they established, once the species has invaded, there's virtually nothing you can do about it. One phenomenon is a major cause of this catastrophe. And according to experts, it's threatening the whole marine environment. This is the story of these invasions, why they're happening, and the steps being taken to prevent them. The oceans cover over two-thirds of the world's surface. These waters are the largest habitat on Earth. And from the remotest depths to the seashore, they contain a dazzling variety of life. But the greatest number of marine creatures live in coastal waters. Because here, where sunlight penetrates to the seabed, food and nutrients can be found in abundance. Most of these creatures stay put. Their dispersal discouraged by natural barriers such as land and by changes in water temperature and salinity. So unique coastal ecosystems have formed where a balance has been established over millions of years. Today, that balance is being drastically changed. And here's the reason why, shipping. This is the Don Quixote, a transoceanic car carrier. She's just left Baltimore and is bound for Zeebrugge in Belgium to load a new consignment of cars. Inside her ballast tanks, she's carrying thousands of tons of seawater drawn from North American harbors. But also inside these tanks are millions of tiny stowaways, all hitching a lift. It's a menagerie of microscopic life forms, mostly invisible to the naked eye. None of these would normally be making this journey. Here at Zeebrugge, as cars are loaded, this water and its stowaways are discharged into a totally foreign environment. And that's when the trouble begins. All ships must carry ballast to keep them steady and level in the water.
When unloading cargo, a ship has to maintain its weight on board to stop it rising up and capsizing. And so water is pumped into specially designed tanks. For centuries, ballast came in the form of rocks and sand. But loading solids onto ships was time consuming and expensive. Then came a revolution in ship design. During the 19th century, wooden hulls were replaced by iron and steel. As these hulls were durable and watertight, it soon became clear that seawater could replace sand and rock. And in harbors, it's always on tap. But there's something else in harbor waters that no one had considered. Well, one of the very interesting things about marine life is that virtually every form of marine plant and animal has a number of different stages to its life cycle. If we take a limpet, for example, the adult limpet spends its adult stage attached to a hard surface such as a rock. But what we need to remember, of course, is that when this limpet reproduces, it releases its egg and its sperm into the water where they fertilize each other, and the small larval limpets float freely in the water before settling again onto a rock to become an adult limpet. And it is that free floating stage called the plankton that can be taken into a ship's ballast tank. But it's hard to imagine how such tiny creatures like these lobster larvae can survive inside a ship. Well, the vast majority of marine life which is taken into ships' ballast tanks actually do not survive because the conditions inside the ballast tanks are very harsh, usually low oxygen, quite dark, and so therefore, during the voyage, most of them will die off. But it's the extremely hardy species and the hardy individuals that may survive, and it's the fact that they survive which makes them potentially invasive when they get to the other end. At any one time, up to five billion tonnes of ballast water is being carried around the world, transferring over 10,000 different species of marine microbes, plants and animals to distant shores, and with devastating consequences. In Iran, the shores of the Caspian Sea attract hordes of holidaymakers, boosting the local economy. But there's another visitor to the Caspian that's a lot less welcome. Fishermen on these shores have been the main victims of this alien presence. Fishermen like Hassan Yusuf Inijad. He made a good living from these waters for over 30 years. He and his crew catch a local fish called kilka at night, using lights to attract them into the nets. Fishing here was very good until 1999. We were fishing with 10 to 12 crew members on each boat. And we would catch between 300 kilos and 400 kilos each. We were happy and content with our lives until this unwelcome creature came to the Caspian Sea. This is the creature responsible for Hassan's problems. It's the comb jellyfish. And although it doesn't look too threatening, the locals call it the monster. Its natural habitat is thousands of miles away, in the waters of the Atlantic Ocean off North America. 
There, its numbers are naturally controlled by other carnivorous jellyfish. But international shipping unintentionally gave the comb jelly a free ride to areas where it has no natural predators. During the 1980s, it showed up in the Black Sea and a few years later in the Caspian Sea. In these waters, already stressed by overfishing and pollution, the population of this alien invader exploded. I think this jellyfish is going to destroy all the kilka. And not just the stock, it will destroy us because our lives are dependent on this fish. We can no longer provide even the bare necessities, and our lives are getting worse each day. We are facing poverty, debt. We can't pay the crews, nor even provide for our families. I can't do anything about this creature. I'm totally helpless. Abdul Ghassim Ruhi of the Iranian Fisheries Research Institute has been investigating why the cone jelly has become such a plague. The jellyfish has spread quickly because of the ample food supply in the Caspian. They feed on the zooplankton which is also the favorite food of the kilka. In fact, the jellyfish is such a voracious predator, it can double its body weight in just 24 hours. And every night, each one reproduces, launching thousands more eggs into the water. It doesn't just eat the food of the local fish, it eats the local fish themselves. They feed on the eggs and larvae of the kilka. So all of these factors have seriously reduced the stock. And consequently, this has had a terrible effect on the kilka fishing industry. All along the Caspian Sea coastline, fishing is one of the main industries. With the fish fast disappearing, the lives of thousands of people have been affected. Specially built fish meal factories have been abandoned. The shipyards, which maintain the Caspian fishing industry, are falling into disrepair. And the Iranian fishing fleet is slowly disintegrating. Men like Hassan, with a young family to bring up, the future looks very uncertain. My only worry is the future livelihood of my children. As a father, I should provide for them. They will need food and clothes, but also an education. I should give them these things, but I don't know if I'm going to be able to or not. Stories like these are unfolding all over the world, and they are not confined to the people and animals living by the coast. Belém Novo is a small village on the edge of Lake Guaiba in southern Brazil. This too used to be a thriving fishing community. Now nobody bothers to go fishing at all. Except one man, Senor Ney.
and he only continues to check his nets from force of habit. Two years ago, I used to catch 500 kilo, 1,000 kilo of fish. I used to sell it. Today, I don't even have fish to eat at home. The cause of the problem is another tiny creature that again seems almost insignificant. This is the golden mussel. The fish eat it, but I think it's harming them, because they've all gone. This is what it does in the water. One mussel has clustered here, and others are growing around it. Now they are growing over themselves, forming a bowl. See, the net is empty. If we had to eat from it, we would be hungry. All we've got is mussels. The golden mussel's natural home is in the rivers of China and Southeast Asia. In the early 90s, it was carried in ships ballast water to the estuary of the Rio Plata in Argentina. Here, with no predators to keep it in check, this freshwater mussel thrived. Just as it got this far in ballast water, so ships continued to carry it further inland. Attached to the hulls of vessels, it traveled thousands of kilometers upriver into Brazil. After only five years of invasion, the mussel reached Porto Alegre. This is a busy port with ships passing to and fro around the continent. Now the banks of the rivers are littered with millions of foul-smelling, razor-sharp mussel shells. And it's these covering the riverbed that are causing untold damage. Maria Cristina Mansour, a specialist in bivalves in Porto Alegre, is studying how something so tiny can be so destructive. The golden mussel builds up into huge clusters which cover every surface, and these join up and form great sheets and mattresses, as the fishermen call them, that spreads over the plants and even the sand around them. It clusters on the stalks and roots of these plants, suffocating them. With that, the area used by fish to spawn has been reduced, and this has had serious consequences on fishing. But it's the golden mussel's astonishing ability to reproduce that's impacting on areas other than fishing. This water supply station has recently seen its maintenance costs triple. Two years ago, servicing took place twice a year. Now this pump has to be lifted every month. Because over 700,000 mussels are packed into every square meter of its surface. The impact of this tiny pest grows ever wider. As it moves further and further inland, it's affecting the very infrastructure of the country. This is one of the biggest hydroelectric dams in Brazil, supplying 10% of the energy generated in the whole country. In 2002, the mussel was discovered for the first time in its reservoir. Not long after, it was spotted by maintenance workers overhauling the system. Uh, 
o que acontece é que nesse no, no sistema when the mussels start colonizing the pipes of the cooling system the quantity of water used to cool everything down is reduced and the machine begins overheating so to preserve itself and to preserve the system as a whole the machine switches itself off so imagine if we have a catastrophe and all the machines decide to come off the system because of a problem like that the lack of energy could cause a blackout in the whole of Brazil the mussel has now reached the Pantanal the largest wetland on earth and a world heritage site it's home to rare species of birds and mammals. The Pantanal is also immensely rich in aquatic plants, which provide food and shelter for many of the animals here. If the golden mussel suffocates these plants, it will upset the whole delicate balance of this unique ecosystem. Nós não temos ainda estudos. We still don't have studies about the impact on the Pantanal. But if we compare the impact the golden mussel has caused in the region of Porto Alegre, it can only be described as a tragedy. Because here the native animals and plants in our rivers have been killed off. And around the world, human health is also being affected by the onslaught of these invasions. Just off the coast of South Africa, what looks like a huge red stain on the surface of the water is actually a mass of living organisms. This is a red tide, a bloom of tiny microscopic algae called dinoflagellates. This phenomenon occurs naturally when changing currents disrupt the nutrient cycle of coastal waters. But such plankton blooms can be disastrous for the marine environment. They can accumulate at the surface of the water and these blooms can then decay and that decay process results in, in, in low oxygen water. And so we can then have extensive mortalities which include these rock lobster mortalities that we see on our coast. These dinoflagellates often find their way into ships' ballast tanks and are transported around the world. This is really bad news, because some red tides can be lethal to humans. This tiny organism produces a most deadly toxin. It causes mass die-offs of some marine creatures by attacking their nervous system. But shellfish such as clams and mussels, remain unharmed. The poison accumulates in their bodies, but outwardly, they appear normal. For one unsuspecting couple, living just outside Cape Town, it was a very close shave. Started off in the morning, it was a beautiful day. I decided to go down to the beach, and it was a bit spontaneous rather than a planned event. It suddenly decided, hey, the tide's low. Let's, let's grab some mussels. The most severe type of uh, uh, red tide poisoning is the paralytic shellfish poisoning, by far. So we go ahead and we pick our mussels, brought them home, cooked them up, and uh, ended up having a great feast lunch outside on the terrace with mussels. And later in the afternoon, suddenly it kind of, it was a sort of a gradual thing. It, 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 it sort of, I suppose, a tingling. Uh, sensation came to my fingers and extremities. Uh, symptoms usually start about one to two hours after a meal. Didn't think too much of it. And most of the time, the patients don't realize that they've got food poisoning. Thought, okay, well, Jean got onto the phone to her GP. GP said, look, it does sound like a bit of muscle poisoning. It can't be that serious. Take a bit of antihistamine, and I'm sure it will go away. Breathing can stop within about 
two to 24 hours after ingestion, depending obviously on the dose. In the meantime, the sensation has actually now increased very substantially. It's up my legs, it's my arms. I'm getting this numbness all over it. In fact, it's a very strange kind of feeling. You felt as one wasn't walking on the ground any longer. It's like somebody who's drunk. Willem's wife, Jean, was really panicking and phoned the poison control unit. And they said, Whew, no, no, you've got to go to hospital. So, oh, come, 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 now, let's now not make a big issue of it. And we've had a case, for instance, where um, husband and wife, they had a meal uh, of uh, shellfish in the evening and they went to bed and the, the husband woke up during the night and he was feeling ill and then he discovered that his wife was dead beside him on the bed. Willem was rushed to hospital and carefully monitored. It was alarming to think what would have happened if we would have stopped breathing and, you know, one so suddenly realizing how quickly these things do just creep up on you, you know, you could have died there in the night, uh, but, and, and, and just quietly in your sleep. Willem Otten was lucky to survive, but paralytic shellfish poisoning is on the increase and ballast water is partly responsible. Ballast water transport of, of red tide or harmful algal blooms um, has definitely been recorded in certain areas of the world. And um, because dinoflagellates have this resting stage, called a cyst stage, so it tends to sink to the sediments of the ballast tank, they are particularly good candidates for ballast water transport. The deadly alien invaders have destroyed fishing industries, threatened power supplies, and put people at death's door. Now, as world trade grows and shipping booms, more and more ballast water is being transported. But shipping also brings tremendous benefits to modern society. Transporting 90% of world trade, it provides a service on which the global economy and its future depends. But there is hope. Action is being taken. And it starts here in London, at the offices of the International Maritime Organization. IMO is an agency of the United Nations, and part of its responsibility is the protection of the marine environment from shipping activities. IMO has taken a number of initiatives, uh, together with its member states, the shipping industry, as well as non-government governmental organization. That's led to the development of a set of guidelines, as well as, more recently, to the adoption of an international convention on ballast water management. The aim is for all shipping to abide by these regulations by the year 2016. Among this measure will be uh, ballast water exchange at uh, mid-ocean, or measure with a view to remove, kill, or reduce the effect or impact of harmful organism carried by ballast water. For these regulations to work, IMO wanted as many countries as possible to sign up. <laughs> and to encourage developing countries, the Global Ballast Water Management Project was set up in cooperation with the Global Environment Facility and the United Nations Development Programme. The objective of this project is to assist six developing countries in putting in place proper arrangement to monitor, assess, and study the, the, the issue of uh, ballast water, and in another hand, to assist them in being prepared for the implementation of the uh, new convention. Under the rules of the convention, all ships must now exchange their ballast water out at sea. What will happen is a ship will take on ballast water in a port. Any species that are contained in the ballast water will be carried with the ship 
that halfway through the voyage, while the ship is in the open ocean, it'll discharge the coastal water into the open ocean and then take on clean open ocean water and continue the voyage. Now, the theory, the, the scientific theory behind this approach is that the coastal species taken on at the port of origin will not survive when they are discharged into the open ocean during the ballast water exchange because the salinity regime may be different, the temperature may be different, there may be less food available in the open ocean. And then any species that may have been taken on in the ocean during the ballast exchange would also not survive when they are discharged into the uh, destination port because, again, the coastal conditions are different from the oceanic conditions. The US Coast Guard is among many port authorities making strict ballast water checks on incoming shipping. Records must show where and when a mid-ocean exchange took place. They then test the ballast water itself. Uh, I'm looking for the um, salinity concentration in this ballast tank. Uh, this is indicative of where they may have picked up the source of water and whether or not they've done an open ocean exchange. If we find that it's a willful violation that they intended to deceive the U.S. Coast Guard in their ballast water management practices, then that could lead to a Class C felony and imprisonment. How's it looking? It's looking good. But not everyone's convinced that ballast water exchange at sea is the answer. In rough uh, weather conditions, a ship's captain may be quite reluctant to undertake uh, ballast water exchange because it may actually threaten the stability and the structural integrity of the ship. So in those sorts of situations, it's probably not a safe thing to do. So this practice of ballast water exchange is very much an interim measure. And what is very important that while this is available as a management tool now, we also need to work to find new and improved ballast water treatment methods to provide a more effective and more complete uh, solution to, to the transfer of these species. Several companies were already developing methods to kill off the organisms inside the tanks. And the ideas they were coming up with had their inspiration in some unexpected places. My boss called this meeting in Los Angeles to see if we could come up with some solutions to treat the ballast water. We'd had this tremendously frustrating meeting. We didn't come up with any solutions. And later, we were sitting in a hot tub, much like this one here, when my boss turned to me and he said, I hate the smell of chlorine in the water. And I'm thinking of um, using ozone in my hot tub at home. It was at that moment he had this eureka moment. It was like a light bulb went off on his head, and he said, well, why don't we use ozone to treat ballast water? He immediately jumped out of the hot tub. He went upstairs, got online, and started a search to look for a company that could help us. He found a company that he thought might be promising, and he called them up and he explained what he wanted. That company turned out to be a large-scale laundry business, which had discovered that ozone was a cheaper alternative to chlorine in disinfecting the water. Ozone is made by passing a high voltage through oxygen. It's much like when you have a thunder and lightning storm. After a burst of lightning, you get that smell, and that is ozone. Ozone is a very effective disinfectant that has been used in drinking water systems for a long time. What we like about it is that there are no dangerous chemicals that we have to put in the ballast water. It dissipates in a few seconds back to its natural elements and that there are no harmful chemicals that will be left 
that could have an effect on the environment. But no one had ever tried using ozone to disinfect seawater. The laundry company knew nothing about oil tankers or ballast water. Nonetheless, they set out to develop and adapt the technology. About two years later, I get this call from these guys and they say, your ozone generator is ready. Where do you want it delivered? This thing was huge. It had been built into a shipping container and required seven miles of piping to deliver the ozone into each ballast tank. In every tank, we have these shower heads that bubble the ozone into the water. And it's these bubbles, as they're decaying, that kill the creatures and the organisms. Although this equipment was effective, its size wasn't practical. We know now that ozone works and is very effective. However, we had to work on the equipment to shrink it and make it more efficient. We have since designed the Mark II version, which we are about to install in one of our tankers. And we hope to have a fully functioning and operating ozone generator system in about a year's time. Meanwhile, a company in Europe had already been testing a different ballast water treatment system under real-life marine conditions. And it was installed on the Don Quixote. We wanted to use a technology that would rid the ballast tanks from invasive species without causing any harm to the environment. So we looked at the, the natural processes that occurs when, when UV light hits the seawater. When microorganisms at the surface are exposed to the sun's strong ultraviolet rays, a reaction takes place that destroys them. You can see example of this damaging nature of the UV light when going down to the beach. Strong UV light will, will cause sunburn and premature aging of the human skin. So we wanted to simulate and enhance these processes in our treatment system. The system is installed in the ship's engine room and is surprisingly compact. It consists of two cylinders, each containing about 20 ultraviolet lamps. Together with a catalyst, the ultraviolet light from these lamps creates highly aggressive free radicals. As the seawater passes through the cylinders, these free radicals attack the microorganisms and break down their cell structure. After two years of testing, the company believes they've found a practical, effective treatment which doesn't compromise the environment. But while promising, these systems may only work for certain types of ship. And this led one company to look for an entirely different solution. This tanker is one of a class of vessels known simply as VLCCs, or Very Large Crude Carriers. At 330 meters long, 60 meters wide, and 30 meters deep, they're the largest mobile man-made objects on Earth. This may appear to be a standard tanker, but it isn't. This vessel is fitted with the prototype of a new system that could revolutionize the way that ships of this size manage their ballast. Tom Allen of the tanker company Vila explains why such a system is necessary. For us in the tanker industry, ballast water exchange is a big problem. If we had to stop at sea and change ballast water out continually as the voyage progressed, it would cost us hundreds of thousands of dollars. The reason for that is the size of these ships. They transport approximately 300,000 tons of crude oil on each voyage which means on the ballast voyage, they carry 100,000 tons of ballast water.
Exchanging all this ballast water several times during a journey would take several days. And if every oil tanker had to do it, it could result in an increase in the cost of petrol. Tom Allen is part of a team that's developing a unique approach that might just eliminate the need for mid-ocean exchange and treatment methods. You know, simple ideas are usually the best ones, and that's what's unique about this system. There are no moving parts. The only thing we need to worry about are these pipeline connections. It's very simple. The hope is that the system could be fitted simply to most existing tankers. Called the flow-through system, it takes advantage of a unique aspect of oil tanker design. As with all oil tankers today, this ship is equipped with a double hull. That means there's a void space between, this, between the side shell plates that we're looking at and the inner cargo space. That void space is used to carry ballast water. That's the problem, and that's why the flow-through system works because it's easy for the ballast water to flow through using the motion of the ship and exit from the side of the ship. On the drawing board, this is how it'll work. Ballast water on double-hulled oil tankers is carried along the sides and bottom of the ship. If a hole is cut in the bows, the idea is that the forward motion of the ship will constantly push new ballast water into the ballast tanks, flushing out the old over the sides. Any marine creatures taken on board in harbour would be flushed out within a matter of hours. But cutting a hole in the bows of an oil tanker is a big step. Before they do this, the team want to test the system using the ship's ballast pumps alone. It's time to flood the dry dock. With 100 million litres of water now in her ballast tanks, scientists go on board to take samples for comparison. Then, for the first ever test of this flow-through system, they have to take her out to sea. As the ship travels forward, water is flushed through the tanks. At intervals throughout the trial, further samples of water from the ballast tanks are taken to see if any harbour water remains. Okay. Salt content, acidity and sediment content are measured on board. Then the samples are taken back to the lab to find out whether any of the critical microorganisms from the harbour waters remain. And the first results are looking good. So far, 
Tests show that some sort of flow-through system might be a viable means of exchanging ballast water. And because of the size of these ships, it could lead to a large percentage of the world's ballast water being managed more effectively. Different ships require different solutions, and these are just a few of the ones being looked at. And there's no time to lose. In South America, the golden mussel is continuing to spread north at a speed of 240 kilometers a year. Left unchecked, it could reach the Amazon basin by the year 2008. population of cone jellies in the Caspian Sea has risen by over 5,000%. They're now threatening the lucrative caviar industry because without the kilka, beluga sturgeon are being starved of food and producing fewer eggs. And outbreaks of paralytic shellfish poisoning from toxic red tides have now been reported as far afield as Florida, British Columbia, Europe, Japan, and Australia. The impacts of invasive aquatic species are one of the four greatest threats to the world's coasts and oceans. The other great impacts are global climate change, overfishing, and marine pollution. And the ballast water and invasive species issue has been identified as perhaps the greatest environmental challenge facing the global shipping industry today. Progress is being made, but its momentum must be maintained so that shipping can work in harmony with the environment.